Hey, how you all doing? Welcome to a uh, welcome to another one of the uh, one of the embedded hours. Uh, this week, I think he's going to be really uh, really interesting. We've got got a good friend of mine, Adam, coming on, who's going to talk to us about his his uh, wonderful world of uh, engineering that he does. He's uh, he's quite a quite an accomplished engineer across a range of disciplines. Actually, he's really really quite an impressive uh, an impressive engineer. Before uh, before I introduce. Uh, Adam and we get we get around to talking to Adam. There are a couple of things I'd just like to uh, like to raise with you. One, I've just if you've ever sort of we've had a few of these uh, webinars where we've talked about sort of high reliability, and we had one with uh, focused on uh, space recently where my friend uh, Barry Cook was was on here. Uh, so I've recently done a little project on hacks. If you want to see uh, what effects sort of single event upsets can have on your state machines and how you can design to make them reliable, there's a little project on Hackster that you might want to go. Uh, and, and take a look at, and it, sim it kind of simulates those effects, so we can we can see what's going on uh, in our state machines when they when they lock up. The other thing I'd like to like to just point in your direction is this year has been really quite interesting for a lot of people, and I mean interesting in a yeah, not in a, not in necessarily always in a good way. Uh, but obviously we've been we've been under lockdown, depending on where we are in the world, for for quite a long time of it. And I realised the other day that I've done. Uh, quite a lot of webinars uh, this year. Uh, so I've done some for Vitus, for Vivado, for Pink, on the ARM M1 and a couple of others. So if you go take a look at my uh, my blog this week at my on my website, uh, you'll find links to those different the, dif the different webinars, the virtual classrooms that I've run this year, and you can find all the uh, lab materials and all of the uh, all of the on-demand recordings. So if you if you want to learn a little bit about about Vitus or Vivado or, or Pink or how even to put ARM, ARM cores in your in your traditional FPGA, then uh, go take a look. Uh, go take a look at that, and uh, hopefully it'll be be of interest and help you uh, help you pass a few a few hours. So we have this week we have a uh, well this month actually so we have a we have Adam joining us. So Adam's a Adam's an aerospace engineer. Uh, by, by training, but actually he does an awful lot of electronics, mechanical, 3D printing. He's a really interesting all-round sort of engineer's engineer, I guess, a, a real a real proper engineer. Uh, so Adam, if you'd like to uh, like to join us, and we can, I'll stop sharing my screen so as we can uh, so as we can all see each other. Uh, if any, obviously, if we get any questions, please pop them in the questions or the chat, and I'll I'll keep an eye on an eye on that. But uh, but first off, Adam, thank you for thank you for joining us. And um, uh, how are you doing today? Is it all all good in your your neck of the world? <laughs> it, it is good. The sun is out. The weather is unseasonably warm here today in in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. So we're we're pretty happy. Yeah, that's good. So I, well, there's a lot of things that I want to wanted to talk to you about. So I mean, the first one is actually. So you're uh, you're an aer by training you're an aerospace engineer, right? You work for a large jet engine manufacturer, I think, and do a lot of do. Uh, yes. sort of mechanical aerospace design. Yes, yes. So uh, by day, I, I I work for GE Aviation. Um, I uh, most recently was part of the GE 9X design team. So we we designed the upgraded engine for the new Boeing 777X. It has a, a fan diameter, and I'm sorry for those that um, don't work in imperial units, but it's 134 inch fan diameter, which is the largest in the world. And it puts out, um, we just got the Guinness Book of World Record um, at over 134,000 pounds of thrust. So to put that in perspective, I, I drive a Honda Civic daily. That's almost 50 of my Honda Civics worth of thrust, so. <laughs> That's, that's quite impressive. I mean, I saw those those engines. I mean, they are just massive, massive, massive engines. They are they are that that triple seven aircraft. It, it's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal thing. Yep. Design jet engines and, and 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 elements for that. And by evening, you do you do because you used a great line to me. You said engineering is a license to learn, uh, which is something I think is a really yeah. cool, re really good explanation and a really cool thing. So by evening, what do you, what, when you come home of an evening, you say, hello, darling, to your wife, and you know, and wander through to your study, and, and what, what are you doing there? <laughs> so, I, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of a menagerie. I look around, and I have development kits scattered around. I have 3D printed parts scattered around. I have, um, you know, some ducted fan uh, units here, because my wife wants me to design a, a little mini wind tunnel for her. Um, Boy, so your wife a wants little... a wind tunnel. 
Yes, yes. Is your wife an engineer uh, as well? So, no, she, she teaches um, for, there's a, a group here called iFly that does indoor skydiving and she teaches their STEM program. And so they have uh, a program that goes over what wind tunnels are used for. And so it's kind of this neat space where what she's doing and what I'm doing get to merge together. And, and um, yeah, she's been going and buying engineering books and reading through them. And she's like, wow, why did I not go do engineering? This is just utterly fascinating. So it's, it's been a lot of fun to, um, to engage in an area where most husbands and wives don't necessarily get to engage. Oh, that's, that's quite cool. I built, build me a wind tunnel. I, I dream of the day my wife says, like, build me a zinc device, you know. Can you build me a state machine, you know? In reality, I just get I, 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 time with us, you know. But uh, Yeah, I, I did build her some Alexa-controlled under-cabinet lights. So, you know, hey, that, that's, that, that's, that's, pretty that's, close. Pretty, that's pretty good. I mean, uh, is that the birthday or the Christmas present? Uh. I don't remember which that was. It does usually come with one of those major holidays um, that uh, this uh, for Mother's Day, I, I got her um, leather seats, uh, leather heated seats that I'm installing in the car. So um, and then I do have planned to make her a, an LED chandelier. So that's pretty cool. So you say you're building a ductive fan. So over the back of you, I can see some 3D printing machines? Is that, I can see three 3D printing machines? Is that, is that right? That yeah, is. I have three that are, he, two right here and one that's over here. Uh, this one over here is about ready to get an upgrade. Um, and I have one that's off camera, a little bit further over here that's, um, you know, it's, it uses a different technology. The three you can see, they, they use, um, basically if you're used to a line trimmer, or a weed whacker, or whatever people call it, I know there's five or six different names. It has filament like that, that um, it extrudes out a hot end device like this. So you would have a filament that comes out here. And this is basically like a CNC hot glue gun yep. is the best way to describe it. Um, so then you can get, you know, nifty shapes like this. Uh, the other one, um, it uses uh, light, uh, it, it Here's a, a photopolymer, um, and uh, so then it has much smoother features, but the build area is much smaller. Okay, so that must they must take up quite a lot of quite a lot of time. Everybody, I, every, the, the reason I've never bought a three D printer is I just don't have the. Everybody I know that's got one kind of loses vast segments of their life and time to trying to get the trying to get the build quality just just right or upgrading it or. Or, or tweaking it is that, I mean do you, do you experience that same that same issue? Uh, yeah I mean part of it is so in in my day job I, I generally design with what are called composite materials so they're plastics that are reinforced with fibers um, and so I'm very used to having to tweak parameters to get a process that works and part of that for me is actually enjoyment. Um, you get to understand I, I've been known to sit there with my seven-year-old son we will sit there for 10 to 20 minutes, just literally watching the printer move around and print. And you gain neat insights by just sitting there. Um, you can see how the, the plastic is laying down when things start to not perform correctly. It changes actually how you design something. Um, and you you start to get into an area where, where you lock things in and, and pretty much it's okay, it's 11 o'clock at night, I'll hit print. I'll go to bed, I'll come back in the morning and 90% and of the time I have something that's just sitting there ready and waiting for me. So it, it works out pretty well, but um, sometimes you wanna print it faster. So you print it at you know, a lower resolution, if you will. Um, and uh, you know, it just depends on what your use case is. Cool. So what are you, what are you using them for? I know, I know you have a particular hobby that you, uh... You tend to you build remote control submarines, which is one of the things I wanted to uh, wanted to talk to you about. I take it you use them a lot in there. So uh, here's one that's in progress. Um, I don't know. I, I it's one of those things where I remember when I first looked at it, I was kind of of your opinion. Oh man, that'll take too much time. It's not worth it. What am I going to use it for? Um, the quality doesn't look that great, and um, then I found one for a hundred dollars and I said, okay, well, a hundred dollars, that's not too bad. I, I can, I can, uh, I can deal with that. And, um, 
I start playing with them and I start, oh, well, hey, I, I need a little clip here under the cabinet. And uh, so you go design up a little clip for the cabinet. Five minutes later, you're screwing something in. And um, so uh, it, it was really great around the house and I'll go a month where I'm just printing solid pretty much every day. And then I might go three months and I'm not printing anything. Um, and so it ebbs and flows and um but but they're very useful devices to have around yeah i think i think eventually i'm gonna have to uh, gonna have to find the space i would i would spin the camera around my office but it's quite a uh, this is the only clean corner that we're looking at really uh, i i think uh, besides our names that may be another thing we have in common uh, i have strategically placed this camera so it gives a relatively clean view of my office <laughs> i think that i think that's one so the, these remote control so what what really started you building the sort of the, you know, the RC submarines? So it, it goes back to a story when I was a real little kid. Um, my dad had bought me this little toy submarine that, you know, on the box, it promises the world, you know, just like any toy marketing. But I was, our, you know, my dad was a mechanic. My grandpa was a mechanic. Um, he had actually started going to school for engineering when World War II came around and and um, so he was in the army as a mechanic. And, and so I came from a very hands-on type background, technical background. And when something promises that it can do something, I expect it to do it. And it didn't do most of it. <laughs> it was very disappointing. Um, yeah, I was probably, let's see, maybe about 10 years old. And um, that, but that experience kind of stuck with me. I always thought, you know, it would be really neat to have something that you know, in a pool, I can go play with, it goes under the water. Um, and it, it really has a lot of ties to uh, aerospace. Uh, a lot of the same principles that you use in a submarine have uh, an analog in, in every other aspect of, of aerospace. And so um, when I got into college, college is, is really great at filling you full of um, very theoretical things. Uh, I think the best way I can describe many mechanical aerospace engineering uh, degrees, it, it will tell you, um, yes, yeah, so we have this tool, it has this polymer handle, the polymer is, um, you know, uh, PETG, and, um, you know, it, it melts somewhere around X number of degrees, it has this metallic thing on it. Oh, by the way, we call it a screwdriver. We don't know what you use it for, but here's a screwdriver. Um, <laughs> And well, what you know, you're saying is it's very theoretical, not very practical in any way, shape or in any way. Yeah, they, they, they kind of want to give you a bunch of tools, but I, I never felt like I had the opportunity to apply those. And so uh, I happened to be searching the Internet. Uh, the Internet was starting to become popular at that time and um, came across a group that did RC submarines. And that kind of reignited that coupled with I had a really good internship so I could uh, I actually had a little bit of money. So I could start buying tools like lathes and things of that nature. And, and that gave me a practical outlet to all the theory. Um, I could then begin to apply some of the, uh, you know, sizing of elements, pressures and seals and, and the level of complexity that you'll find in your average RC submarine is on the order of a, a radio control helicopter. So um, just lots of things to dig into and optimize. That's really, that's really quite cool. So how many of it, how many of these have you, so, so do you design them completely from scratch? Do you come up, sit there, come up with a concept? Do you, do you model them after real world submarines? Uh, so, you know, this one is kind of a, an intermediate, you know, this is just a little plastic model kit that um, you can buy. In this case, the company is called Micromer. Um, Ravel uh, has quite a few submarine kits. Um, trumpeter and so one path is is you buy a plastic model kit and then convert the inside um, and usually the guts I, I always custom design myself um, but there are groups that will sell the watertight compartment and all the radios and things of that nature as well so if you want to buy something off the shelf you can you'll just pay a lot more for it. So, so, so talk me through there what, what, what goes into it so you decide you want to build one so you sort of you start do you start with a do you start with a hull or a chassis in, in mind? Do you do you model? Yeah, a, so, do you kind of look and model a, a real one. Do you look at like the U.S. submarines and say, "Well, I'm going to model a, an Ohio class or a 
she all was, right so uh, um, let's let's see if, if i wanted to start completely from scratch which um you know i have a a design right now so um you know th this particular one right here um this is uh the uss albacore um and what makes this boat unique is it was a test boat that was done in the u.s to trial a whole bunch of things like what they call a a hull of revolution basically you take a line and you revolve it around an axis um, and it actually has some heritage to um British airships, uh, one of the, the, the shapes that was trialed for uh, one of the airships was brought to the US and there were some studies around that and um, the David Taylor model basin then created a series of parametric hulls that they were looking for the best drag and other performance characteristics. Um, but the one thing that makes a scale submarine a lot of fun is, uh, they're secretive. Uh, even 50, 60, 70 years later, sometimes it can be very hard to find information. And so engineers, we, we tend to like to have problems that are very hard to solve, at least a lot of us. And so um, that leads you on kind of this, this chase to find information. Um, and I've been able to meet some really fantastic people. One of the individuals I work with is uh, Jacob Gunnarsson. He's uh, now residing in Hawaii. And, you know, he's been able to go to the US National Archives and start to pull up information. And what's been neat is, as you look through the archives, you will find information about why they made design decisions. Um, and so you start to get not just the, the written history of the boat that a lot of people, the operational history, but you start to see the technical history um, which in and of itself is extremely fascinating. You know, why did somebody decide to make um, a particular trade and optimize one area at the expense of another area? And um, <clears throat> so that's been a lot of fun. It, just last night, well, I guess very early this morning, 4 a.m. my time, he and I were chatting. We had uh, kind of, he has a set of information and I have my set of information. Between the two sets of information, um, we begin to find these little tidbits of information that without the two pieces, um, we wouldn't be able to extract. So we were on another boat that we're working on, um, which is both the Skipjack and, and George Washington class. We we're able to start extracting dimensional values and then plugging that into this parametric equation that was made to uh, systematically study the hulls. And lo and behold, our, our equations are starting to fit um, and the parameters. And so you, you get this kind of euphoria of, of finding information that hasn't been seen for years. And um, so it's, it's, it's fun. So you start that side. So maybe you go in and, and you have to research all the data or you take a plastic model kit um, that somebody has already done and you say, okay, well, I have this plastic model kit. Um, now I, I need to build, um, you know, they, they go by various names, but you know, this is you know, part of a watertight compartment. Um, so your batteries and radio receiver go up here. Um, <clears throat> this is the ballast control that sits here in the middle. And then you have uh, you know, your speed controller, uh, your motor back here, a couple of servos that sit right here. And then here's your push rods that come out. Um, so you... Uh, you can either design something like this, you can buy these off the shelf with some groups. Um, and there are some kits that uh, they have everything you need ready to run and you just have to go purchase that uh, and then assemble it. So there's, there's a lot of different ways to get into the hobby. Um, it, it is not a cheap hobby, that's for sure. It, it really, it doesn't sound it. So once you've got your, once you've got your sort of the, 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 the chassis, I guess, the, the, the architecture for the, for the what actually, what elements actually go into it? What, so what, what do you actually need in there? So you, you touch on like sort of obviously you want to be able to communicate, you need to be able to have a motor to control it and drive it. Do you, are you, are you able to change the buoyancy of it to sort of raise and sink? The depth yeah, so the that's, there, there's a variety. This is what, what is traditionally called a piston tank. And um, yeah, what, what that is, let's see if I can get it apart here without destroying it. Um, it basically, you have a piece of lead screw right here, and then right in here, this is a plunger with an O-ring, mm -hmm. 
it's it's just a, a giant syringe that's motorized in in this particular case and then on the back side um i have a, a diode and a limit switch that sit right back there and on the inside similarly there's a diode and a limit switch that uh, are the in stops for the device <clears throat> and so that's one way there are other ways that um there we go i can so there's kind of the, uh, let's see if we can get it to focus. Yeah, that's just inside. about in focus, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then then this is, I mean, it's nothing special. It's just a tube that, um, that the piston travels in. So this is your depth control. And, and basically your goal is, is to create something that's neutrally buoyant so that the average uh, volume of the water that's displaced and the weight of what you're displacing is uh, that the densities are equal. Um, so you have to have buoyancy control. You have to have a radio that can penetrate the water, um, which is becoming more and more challenging because the frequency, so Europe uh, is usually 40 megahertz. Um, and in the US, 75 megahertz are the frequencies that are allowed for operation of radio control devices at the surface or below the surface. And, um, but the whole industry has moved to 2.4 gigahertz uh, from the perspective of chipsets started to become, you know, RFICs for 2.4 gigahertz became extremely cheap. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot more bandwidth was available plus uh, spread, spread spectrum frequency hopping techniques. And that allowed more models to be able to operate particularly in the airplane and, and uh, car space. Uh, but the challenge is, is 2.4 gigahertz is not so good for water though is it? it it is a microwave frequency <laughs> literally a microwave frequency um and, and a lot of people it's funny the debate will come up periodically oh well i'm gonna go try it. you engineering types just don't know what you're talking about i remember one of the stories some some wonderfully brilliant individual i hope my sarcasm is coming through on that decided to go put like a, a a 10 watt amplifier on a on on something and put it underneath the water and they noticed that bubbles were coming off the antenna and that the water also happened to be relatively warm around them i uh i, I hope that they had shielding around a few vital components of their human body um but yes they were finding out that uh, microwaves truly are microwaves and they work by heating up water not just generically heating up the food so, um, so i presume that so i mean how how far how if, you, if you're working with the sort of the, the the 70 the 40 megs or the 75 megs how far how much penetration do you get through the water with that how, how obviously I, I take it it varies on water conditions but correct I mean, how, how, so, deep can you, how deep can you send these things um you know, if you're operating in brackish water, you're, you're, you're not going to work very well. Um, it's, you know, it's the same issue that any sort of Navy around the world has to communicate with their submarines. Uh, conductive water is extremely lossy and um, you, you just don't penetrate the water. But if you're but, in something, go ahead. You no, know, I was going to say, but they have, I was going to say, like the Navy, they have like kilometers long cables, don't they, for the, for the antenna to well, the back of the screen. And there are frequencies that are, are so low that the bandwidth is, you know, um, it, it's, it's ridiculously low. It's basically, they're able to send a handful of letters that say, come to periscope depth, and then we'll tell you more. Um, but in, in something like this, if you're operating in something like a pool or fresh water, um, if the pool... I found that uh, outdoor pools, when I was living in Arizona, they would collect a lot more uh, particulates in the water, cause the water to increase in conductivity. And so your depth capability wasn't always that great in a pool from time to time. But if it's an indoor pool or the water's been freshly changed, you can go to the deep end of a pool. And so you can have uh, you know three to five meters pretty easily. Um, and then if you're in really clear lake-like waters, um, you know, some people have taken those down to uh, more than 10 meters and decided that they had no purpose in running anything at, at that depth and, and declared a win and moved on. Um, so you can get uh, pretty deep without having any sort of concerns. And then fail safes will be installed in the boat. Let's see if I have my fail safe in this one. Uh, I do, but it's, it, 
doesn't look like much because it's just uh, in, in a bunch of heat shrink. But um, with the fail safes, you basically dictate that if there's a loss of signal for a certain period of time um, or the signal becomes degraded, that it will then, um, you know, remove the ballast from the boat and bring it to the surface. So you have some intelligence uh, as well as the sort of the little RC, the, 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 I guess the motor control that controls the motor, the, the planes and the, the ballast. You have a little sure. microcontroller in there or something that manages, that manages all of this? So. Yeah, just a little uh, pick or you know, I've been migrating to STM32s and, and uh, so you can just use something that, that reads um, the signal is encoded in, in um, pulse position modulation. Um, so it's an analog signal that's based off time duration and you can go in and, and measure the duration of the time um, or the absence of a frame. Usually it's repeating every 20 to 50 Hertz, depending on how many channels you're trying to encode. Um, yeah, they can be a little bit faster. And um, if that frame is either of data is corrupted or completely absent, then you say, okay, um, I'm missing a certain number of channels of data that I was expecting, or I'm missing frames of data for X period of time. If this is uh, a true condition, then execute. And, and basically you, you tell it to position servos to certain positions um, or drive certain states for, for speed controllers. And, and that will bring the boat to the surface. That's, that's pretty cool. That's because obviously, obviously once you've spent a lot of, like you said, this is an expensive hobby. So I'm taking it you don't want to have to become a qualified scuba diver to go and retrieve it from the, uh, from, the um, bottom of, from the bottom of the lake. Th there have been many an individual that have had to go swimming uh, unexpectedly. <laughs> um, but, you know, part of one of the projects that I have going on, and this has been a long-term project, um, but, you know, here's a, let's see if we can, maybe I'll put it in there. A little, oh, is that uh, a little board you've designed? Yeah, so this is a little RFIC uh, chip here. Um, the company was originally Axiom, um, and then they were bought by On Semiconductor. And they have a fantastic little chip, and through my probing of the chip, I know that I've set it up so that it's actually filtering the data right, but I haven't figured out how it, it wants to output digital data, not analog data. And um, they're... Well, their 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 user's manual on it in, in traditional fashion for anything that's an off use case is, is wonderfully documented. Um, even the use cases are are particularly wonderfully documented um, or, or not. And um, and their their help has not been well. We'll say super helpful. They, I, I will say, hey, I'm reading this in the in the user's guide, and it's section this, this, and this, and I can read it this way, or I can read it this way. And they respond back. Go read the user's guide. <sighs> yeah, I don't think that's un I don't think that's unusual in the sort of the embedded spaces. And I think you know, document documentation generally is is quite poor. Um, but uh, but hey, uh, yeah, it would be spoiled if it was easy. It'd be boring. This is I'm going to get some mugs made up with that. If it was easy, it'd be boring. But so, so the, the nice thing about this is uh, I because I don't have a deadline on it, and it is my hobby. I'll pick something up and um, I'll start working through it and I don't understand it. I hit a roadblock and I'll put it away for six months, maybe a year, and then I'll pick it back up again. And, and it's what, what I find interesting is, is um, through that period of time, I've learned more in certain areas and I look back at the problem I, and you kind of slap yourself on the forehead and you say, well, why was this so hard? And, and you begin to, to move forward and you're able to understand how to get through some of the problems. Um, and so I, over the last couple of months, I've been looking at this chip and I think I have another way to go, go take a whack at it. So oh, that's, that's good. But so you, so, so this is quite interesting because your, your, your degrees in aerospace engineering, right? You did a, you said you did right. an aerospace engineering degree at the university of Arizona and now you design now and you design all the electronics for your, for your little projects and your little submarines yourself. How that must be, that must be quite quite a change really how, how did how did that come about what was the what was the learning curve like and submarines uh, actually um <laughs> so in, in working with them a, a lot of people in the hobby um you know they wanted to implement functions they want to have you know the sonar 
uh, work or they want to have um, uh, masks that will come up out of the sail. And uh, so they, they would do these fantastically elaborate uh, mechanical devices. But the challenge is, is you're, you're often operating in chlorinated water. Um, you're in an enclosed environment and it gets warm because of all the heat of the electronics. So those are generally all bad things for mechanical devices. Um, you have corrosive elements that's hot and humid. Um, and so people would, would design these things and then they would fail <clears throat> and they're constant points of maintenance. And then you start looking at it and you say, well, not only with electronics could I do that, but then I can do a lot more um, that kind of pushed me into, well, I want to go do these types of things. And so while I was in school, I'd be talking to my EE friends and they say, oh yeah, what you want to do isn't hard, um, but we don't have any time to help you. And um, so I heard that for, I don't know, maybe five years. And finally I said, well, they said it wasn't hard. So I jumped in, I think I, I bought a, a pick kit three and a pick 18 development board. Okay. And um, uh, with Chuck Hellebuck's um, books on learning C programming. So my only prior programming before that was MATLAB and uh, dived into the uh, world of C programming. And I'm not going to say it was easy, uh, but it wasn't hard. This was prior to the days of Arduino really becoming popular. Um, and so that kind of grew. I, I made a couple of boards that were successful, sold a couple of little speed controllers to people in the hobby. And um, from there just kept growing. And, and about that time, the ARM Cortex-M processors were really beginning to take off and microchip wasn't pursuing that as their path. Um, they were sticking with the MIPS ar architecture for their higher end microcontrollers. And um, so I kind of looked and I said, well, do I want to stick with microchip? And I started exploring and landed on the uh, STM32 microcontrollers. Uh, the challenge at the time was, is there weren't a lot of good IDEs around for playing with them. And I'll admit, um, I am definitely not a command line type person. Uh, I, I don't fault those that are. I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually. I, I much prefer GUIs. I'm, 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 a very, I'm a very visual person. It's uh, probably one of the uh, reasons it, I don't get on with Linux so well, because I just can't it, rem remember long command lines and just sit there typing them in for everyone to do. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, it, it seems that there's this constant debate if, if you're a real developer, if you if you don't uh, use the command line or not. Um, so I, I'm apparently not a real developer. And um, but uh, STM32 from a hardware perspective, value wise, um, particularly their timers are, are of great use in radio control projects. Mm -hmm. uh, they have fantastic timers. So started using them as well as um, the PSOC line from Cypress. Uh, and those are kind of my go-to chips. So I've never, I've never used the PSOC. Are they really? Are they quite? quite are they as good as they look? Because they look, they look really quite interesting. They are fantastic little chips. Um, they, I, I have um, a handful of them. I'm, I'm surprised I don't see one right here immediately on my desk. I'm sure it's buried under something. But um, oh, there we go. It's tied up to a bunch of. Uh, Hardware lines, but I, I have this. Uh, now, if it's connected to something, don't don't. Oh yeah. Yeah, too late. So they have this great. Their their development kits are are really fantastic. They have a couple of um, boards that you can get for um, their PSOC four series. I think for under five dollars, um, and they're much more powerful than any sort of Arduino that you would get. Um, and then they're they have a couple different IDEs that that they use. Um, I will admit I'm biased against their current IDE. It's gone to an Eclipse-based IDE that um, I just don't like Eclipse. Um, their previous IDE uh, is called PSOC Creator and it's it's uh, very much a, a GUI type tool. You have these hardware blocks that you drag onto the schematic. You wire them up to other components. You want a programmable gain amplifier. You drag that in, connect it to your pin, um, and, and they're really fantastic. And then they, they do have, um, you know, you can program some of the hardware blocks in Verilog to create your own unique blocks if you so desire. Oh, okay. um, so 
they're, they're, they're this kind of, they sit in this space between FPGA and microcontroller that um, they're, they're pretty unique devices. Yeah, Elias, one of, one of the earlier contributors to the presenters, he's just, he just mentioned in the chat actually that you can, that you can write Verilog in the, uh, in the PSOC program. Have you ever tried that? Because I know, I think we first got to know each other through Max's kind of all programmable planet type thing when you were learning, I think you were learning Verilog at the time. Was it Verilog or VHD? Did I try to twist your arm to learn VHDL? Uh, I, 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 I started down uh, a little bit with um, VHDL. Um, I, I haven't pursued it to the extent, but I do have a, a um, the RDA7 board here um, that I have gotten it to, to blink and, and I can make switches work. I need to get back to it. So, um, but yeah, it's, um, I have pulled in some blocks and done kind of some copy paste from other people's uh, work to modify a block to do what I wanted more particularly. Okay. I'll have to, I'll have to check. I'll have to get one of those little piece up boards and, uh, and, and check it out. I highly recommend them. If you tried the Cube MX software for the STM32 chips, have you, have you tried that? I have. Out? Is it good? What's yes. Your view on it? Uh, so I, I enjoy it. I think when I, when I view any sort of, um, microcontroller so I, I look at like um nordic semi and they have really fantastic microcontrollers but they don't have any sort of configuration tool um and uh you know i'll admit i'm lazy i don't want to invest uh a significant amount of time to go through somebody's api set of apis to find out if it actually does what i want it to do mm -hmm. um and STM for the longest time did not have a configuration tool. I think it's been in the last five years or so that they've heavily invested in, um, in their configuration tools. They work across multiple IDEs. And then of course they have their, well, I think they call it STM32 IDE. So they actually have their own, uh, they bought Atollic and, um, and incorporated their software and that's becoming more and more integrated the one thing that really bothers me about that is there's no like just you always have to um go into debug mode there's no just download to the target button and so that's kind of annoying because sometimes i just wanted to tweak a time you know i want the led to blink a little faster i want the servo to react a little bit faster and i'm actually just testing it right there in the loop and I have to go into the debug mode and hit run anyway. It's minor annoyance. Uh, that, that, that can be a little annoying. So actually, some, so, so you mentioned something I wanted to come back to actually. So you, you mentioned that people have tried to put sonar in these things. Yeah, so I, I think the simplest one that I've seen, well, probably the most elaborate one, but um, simplest in technology is somebody put two microphones and then rebroadcast the stereo output of those two microphones and uh, to their headset. And well, that's, it, it's super simple and people are like, oh, that won't work. You could actually hear objects as they traversed from left to right. And it was fascinating. That's um, pretty, yeah, that's pretty cool, yeah. So that kind of got me thinking, STM has this um, development kit, I think it's called the, uh, what are they? I think it's blue coin. Um, I have, uh, have it in my box of tools. It has four microphones on it and it will actually tell you the direction that sound is coming from. And so I've wanted to kind of get into that a little bit more and see if you can break it down based upon frequency. Um, and then put that in the bow of, of a submarine and use it for things. Um, so I take it this is all the this is all sort of passive sonar. Then you're just listening to things, or is it actually are they actually doing like active type of sonar? Nobody that I know of it. Well, nobody in the hobby space is doing, excuse me, active sonar. There are in the kind of ROV professional space. Um, there are groups that have full up side scan sonar. Good, yeah. Um, and it's extremely expensive. Um, and I saw one of the guys on Twitter that was actually pursuing playing with something like that. So I have a high amount of interest in 
seeing what he does with that. But then another group was taking um, some of these just simple fish finders, which are active sonar. Oh, yes, yes. And playing with those for different applications, they weren't applying it to an RC submarine. But I saw that and I said, well, I'm really interested in that. So um, those are some kind of like future space for me to go play in. But I, I, guess, I guess a bit of the challenge is actually sort of, I did some work a few years ago, sort of working in uh, working in missiles and aerospace and in the aerospace and defense. And a big challenge was actually minimizing the like you have all the electronics and the, the key thing is kind of fitting it into the fitting it into the package. You've got a fairly constrained a fairly constrained environment, I guess. Most of you are taking it with kind of batteries or ballast or motors, I assume. It depends on how big your boat is. Um, so one of the boats that I want to build is going to be. Um, one thirty second scale, and it will make it so that it's almost. Um, let's see if I can get my unit conversions right. Um, just under three hundred millimeters in diameter, and uh, about two meters long. So <laughs> with something that is that big, I got plenty of space. You got plenty of space in there. You could. You could. You could. You could. You could. You could put all sorts in that, yeah. That's so when you get a big boat, the problem is, is it's mostly empty. Yeah. So what do you go put in it? And um, I presume you need to add a lot of ballast in a big boat to make it sort of to get that sort of buoyancy. Correct. Yeah. So I don't want to just add dead weight. I want to go put something in it that's going to be useful. Yeah, um, so and, and that's that, that's really the fun thing of the hobby is, is there's so many little aspects that you can go and learn there's the systems perspective that you can look at you can look at um, sonar which would take you into um, signal processing um, you can look at the motors and yes i have designed my own motors for these why because i could uh, no other reason I I about it, about it. So, you, um, so, you your motor. So, so that's a real engineering answer i designed my own motor <laughs> I mean, how long how long did that take you did you did you what did you start out with when you wanted to start your mode what when you wanted to start designing your motors it, it this, was, is, this is actually why engineering projects not only our own projects but company projects go on and on and on and on and on because you find some manager that you convinced that you could do it yourself i was <laughs> i was talking to roll i think it was rolls royce aero engines or something and they'd invented their own processor and i was like why did you do that and the answer was well because we could get away with it <laughs> well i think you know, the difference between home and work. So I, I recently had, um, you know, a, a very large uh, technical company call me up for an interview on, on um, you know, makerspace. And they said, well, we want to talk about, you know, what drives you to finish a project? And I said, well, the problem is what defines finished? <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, the person on the other line, you can tell that they were an engineer because they just start busting up laughing. And, you know, for me, every day at work, I know what defines finished. I have uh, a set of deliverables and I have timelines that I need to work to. But at home, my deliverable really is learning. And so some projects I'll start and quit because I achieved the learning that I was trying to get out of it earlier than I expected. Or other projects I find so interesting that I continue them on and continue to explore the space that they'll provide. And, um, you know, that, that's what I really love about my home projects is, is they're often never done. So this one on designing a motor, it was, um, I usually take two weeks off at the end of the year and it was kind of one of those spaces at two or three in the morning that I'm like, well, I can't find something that exactly fits what I want it to do. So I've never designed a motor before. Let's go do it. And um, it worked. Um, it was fun. And, and would I do it again? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but you've done it. That's, that's, that's the cool thing about it. I mean, so this is an, it's an interesting area because engin to engineers, you know, if you, you have like, if you're in your commercial job, you know, you've got the requirements that you meet, the deliverables, and, you know, they're, they're really important. So as we all get paid and we can pay, our, can pay the mortgages at the end of the month. But when you have these little fun projects and you can just kind of learn and sort of go off at tangents and, and continue doing things, they're really good. 
But do you think, and I, I have my own views on this, which I'll tell you in a minute, but do you think doing your own little projects actually makes you a better engineer at work? Oh. Do, you think it, do you think it gives you a new, a new, new aspects, new thoughts, new considerations? Actually, Absolutely. you're quite multi-skilled. You must be a real pain to your electronics engineers that you're working with. You must be like, I've <laughs> um, seen that problem before. <laughs> so I, I'll admit I'm, I have a different way of looking at things if you couldn't already tell. Um, but for me, when I set my goals, you know, some people try and set their goals so they can achieve every one of their goals. And for me, that's failing. Because if I set my goals and I achieved every goal, then I never actually found out how far I could go, right? And so my perspective is, is I should be probably achieving about 80 to 85% of the goals that I set. Um, and 15 to 20% I should fail in. Why? Because it meant that I pushed myself so far that I couldn't achieve it. Now, it doesn't mean that learning didn't occur. Um, maybe I didn't get to the goal in the time that I set. Um, but I think that, that particularly what I try and do is I try and at home find projects that can go push me that I can fail here at home so that I can take that back to work. And therefore I don't have to fail at work. Um, I would much rather fail on my engineering projects at home than at work. Um, yeah, and so, I, I think I fly a lot. I'd much rather you fail at home than on your, than on your uh, jet engines. Well, the, the, the real interesting thing is, and I think this is something that, um, you know, the general population, we're just so used to the appearance of perfection. You look at your cell phone and, and it just works, right, generally. And people don't realize that your cell phone is failing all the time. It just manages those failures in a way that is imperceptible to the user. And similarly with mechanical designs, we, you know, in a jet engine, it surprises a lot of people what we say, we actually design it so that they, it's, it's fault tolerant. There can be cracks in the engine. We set out limits and then you go in and it's just like your car, you know, you have to replace tires on your car. Well, your tires fail. We don't perceive it as failure, but it's, it's a failure mode. So yes, we, we do have jet engines. They are failure modes. We just design around them. You know, we fire birds at the engine to know how when you ingest a flock of geese, will you contain all that failure and can you land safely? You just hope that you don't do it into both engines. <laughs> <laughs> There's some great videos on the internet of, uh, if, if anyone has never seen them, it's seen anybody doing it. But that's, I mean, that's really, I mean, I, obviously I do, I'll do a lot of uh, sort of high reliability electronics design. It's, it's exactly the same, you're trying to do I'm trying to work out what the failure modes are and predicted and, and designed to make sure that it that it that it doesn't. And you're right, people don't understand that things do fail. It's it's how you handle the failure that's the uh, that's the that's the that's the important bit. So Kevin's just ask a uh, Kevin's just asked a question. And then there's a funny question just popped into the chat that I'll ask. So Kevin uh, just asked a question about what sort of resources and tools would you recommend if you were like if you're an electronics engineer and you wanted to get started in Sort of creating your own 3D and mechanical designs. If you've got a, if you think about buying a 3D printer, what would you, what would kind of, what tools and resources would you recommend they go away and invest in or, or look at anyway? Yeah. So um, I think it, there, if you're an open source fan, then I would say, um, you know, from a 3D design, FreeCAD is, is a tool that is very popular and usable. Um, if you prefer more of a commercial, but still free, then Fusion 360 is very popular. Um, and, and that gets you into the mechanical design. From a, a printer standpoint, for about 200 US dollars, you can find a very competent printer that will get you started. Will it do everything? No, but it should come with a, a heated bed. Um, and that, that in today's day and age, you, you really wanna have a heated bed. Um, it will allow you to print materials up to things like ABSs, which are a lot more heat resistant. Um, and I think a lot of it is, is being willing to go in and fail um, and not stopping at your first, second or hundredth failure. Um, you have to go in and as things fail, assess why they're failing. 
that will build up your knowledge. YouTube is really great nowadays for, um, for all of the different, um, that's my a little left behind you. <laughs> yes. Um, YouTube is really great for the, um, you know, a lot of videos out there, a group, uh, one guy, he's out of Australia called teach teaching tech. I think, um, uh, Chuck Hellebuck is another good one that, uh, he, he has actually came from the EE world and went into 3D printing. Um, and so a lot of people should be able to relate to that. Um, he's out of Michigan, if I remember right, here in the U.S. And um, But like I said, a lot of it is, is being willing to learn and, and then beginning to build a network. You know, Twitter, I have... I remember when I first heard about Twitter, I'm like, what can you do on 140 characters? Now we have 280, I guess. Um, but it allows for this great a, asynchronous communication. I can follow people and get their information, but they don't have to follow me. I can still ask them questions. Uh, and you'll find that there are great communities that are out there. Um, and the one thing that I say with Twitter, because a lot of people, oh my goodness, there's so much politics use the filtering tool. They, they have ways that you can filter specific words out. Um, I have on, on both sides of the political aisle, including uh, some from the UK, political words from the UK that I filter out um, so that I just get the content that I'm specifically looking for. Um, and you find those communities and, and ask questions. I mean, I think, I think that's one of the great things today. There is a lot of you know, like Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, Reddit. There's just a lot of people sharing, sharing information and helping. And it's, it's amazing if you think about the last, the last kind of 10 years where it's, it's all, before then it used to be very quite close and, you know, cab tools were expensive and you got to pay them or if they were, if they were free, they weren't very good. And now, now if you take a look at like, you know, the open, what's available in open source tools and the communities and what people are doing, it's really, it's really quite impressive and, uh, and, and yes, yeah, so I, I am on Twitter. If anybody's interested, you know, reach out arrow engineer one, um, the number one, A E R O not, not A R R O W. Uh, I've had people try that before that that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but that's, that's quite cool. So Ilias actually just asked a question and, I, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but it did make me chuckle when I read it. So I'll, I'll, I'll read it out anyway. So he was asking if when you fire the birds out the engine as to whether they're frozen or not. They are not. Um, we have, um, so we do a series of tests. We, we do have to do a hailstone test and some of those hailstones, uh, will be up to, um, you know, almost 50 millimeters or two inches in diameter. Um, so some of those are very, very large. Um, and just depending on the type of test that we do, we also do water ingestion tests where we pump in, you know, it, it's, when you think of a jet flying at, um, you know, hundreds of miles an hour um, in a cloud and how much water content there is or in a rainstorm, yeah. you are testing substantial amounts of water at a time and you have to ensure that you don't remove heat from the engine um, at a rate that you can't still sustain combustion. And so there's ways that you can design such that the water doesn't get into those types of areas or that you can deal with it. Um, the birds, we actually have different levels of birds. So you have um, small, medium, and large. Um, and we have to do various types of tests depending on the, the size of bird and the size of engine will also, so if you're you know, in a, a GE9X size engine, um, you know, we have to take a much larger bird and still continue on. But if you're in something that is on like a, a regional jet, um, those engines are substantially smaller in diameter. You start to try and put in like a seagull down the inlet and, and that takes up a substantial portion of the inlet compared to something like a, a GE 9X. Um, and so, um, but when we're doing testing, so when we're doing official FAA testing, we, we actually do use birds, um, but in simulated testing, we may use something other than a bird that um, is chilled to a point that it's it's slightly congealed so yeah yeah that makes, that makes sense that makes sense well that's really quite a, that's really quite uh, quite interesting you, you you really do cover every element of engineering you know from sort of mechanical engineering to composite engineering to electronics 
to software, to FPG, to, free, to 3D printing you. The, real, uh, the challenge that I have is like, I call it my hobby, but I don't know any engineer that really has a hobby that they don't practice to a level that they like, we never do anything halfway, right? No, no, yeah, yeah, you know, if you're gonna do it, you might as well do it right, yeah? <laughs> and, and so finding peers can be challenging um, in the sense, not that people aren't good, but uh, I've gotten to the point where a lot of times forums aren't very useful to me because the, the level of technical exchange is not very high. Um, and there's a lot of, it, we'll say unsubstantiated type theories of why something's not working as opposed to more rigorous, well, hey, how do we go at this? And um, so I, I think, you know, to that question of, of what tools do you go and use, the, the biggest challenge is really finding good peers, um, people that you know that you can ask questions to, somebody that you can say, look, I feel like an, I'm an idiot. I know that this should be super simple. I remember, for example, when I started out, you know, um, spy, you know, the spy bus, mm -hmm. it, it just did not make sense to me. Okay. I got to proceed it with a one or a zero, depending on if I'm reading or writing. And then I got to just shove garbage data onto the line so I can get something back that I, I mean, that, that didn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense much at all. Really. It's a really weird little, it's a really weird little protocol. <laughs> and, and so, but until I realized that it was just a shift register, then yeah. I understand why I have to put, it didn't matter. I, I got hung up on, I just have to send any data. I'm like, well, why? Um, and I, I got, and I put that aside for two or three months. And then I finally found this one thing online. I was searching for something else and they described it as the shift register. I'm like, oh, I, well, why didn't I see that before? That's super easy. Um, and so I think that to me is, is kind of the, the biggest challenge when you want to go at something and you want to practice it at a very um, deep level, um, how do you find the, the right peers? Yeah, I think that I think that's a I think that's a good a good point and a good you know it's a good a good challenge really to go away and to go away and find them. Now I think it's not only difficult in your hobby as well. I think it's difficult in the world of work as well to find the relevant the relevant sort of peers and people that you can you can work with and, and talk to and communicate with. So we've literally flown through the hour, you know, like engineers do. You just sit there chatting away. I had one one last question just because I saw it on your thing. You something. You mentioned you were restoring, a, you, you started out restoring a plane when you were very young. Yeah, so <clears throat> age 12, uh, I got the opportunity to work at a restoration shop. Um, this is out in Arizona, um, restoring Luska Model 8. So it's a very particular type of airplane built uh, between 38 and 61 off and on by three different companies. It's a small two-place, high-wing, all-metal airplane. And um, it was, you know, I, I already had a desire to be an engineer prior to that, but that really cemented this, um, the need. One of the things that I see in engineering is you, you, you have a lot of people that are very good theoretically, but they've never truly had to go put their hands on what they've designed. Um, and so for me, this background in, in aircraft restoration really has, has kind of dictated my approach of, um, I need to consider who's going to be using my parts downstream and how will I design things differently, whether it's electronics or documentation or a mechanical design with the recognition that somebody has to build it, somebody has to maintain it and, um, yeah, you know, I remember there was times there's there were these turnbuckles that were underneath the floorboard, and you had to safety wire them. But there was no physical line of sight you had to put in one hand on on this side and one hand on this side. And the turnbuckles are right, and you're doing everything blind. And um, so those were the types of things that when you actually get to see your hardware or get to see your program working and interact with the users you really get a better, you, if you created a program and you see somebody using it, you're like, well, that's not how you're supposed to use it. Well, that's your vision. But the person ultimately that is using it 
it's their vision that's more important than your vision. And um, so, yeah, that's that for me is really foundational um, that and has fused engineering and practical to, to come together. That's, I think that's a good, I think that's a good, a good, a good point, a good, a good message. You always have to, yeah, you have to consider that, but the end user and, and how, you know, how you design it might not be generally how they use it as well. So and we're going to have to wrap up here because that's brought us to the, uh, brought us to the hour. Uh, so Adam, Thank you very much. It's been it's been fantastic to uh, to catch up with you again and to and to talk about this. And I really and I hope you sort of I'll keep an eye on your Twitter because I really want to see this two meter submarine. I think that's going to be uh, <laughs> I think that's going to be fan, I think that's going to be fantastic. I can't I can't can't wait to see that. Uh, everybody else, thank you thank you for uh, thank you for attending and, and coming along. We'll we'll pop the uh, we'll pop the recording on YouTube for anybody that wants to uh, wants to watch it again. And the next, the next embedded hour will be on the 11th of December. And we're going to have Max back on, actually. We're going to have, Max has been writing some blogs to me on how to get an engineering job and keep it. Uh, so now he's, so now he's kind of, what, like he always does, he's kind of uh, got a lot more ideas and a lot more thoughts that he wants to come back and, uh, back and share with us all on that. And actually he wants to try and get a little panel of people together of, across the ages who all went to the same unit, we all went to the same university. So hopefully we're going to be able to pull that off and get that going. Uh, on the 11th, if not, we'll uh, we'll we'll do the panel at a later date. But Max is definitely going to be uh, going to be here uh, on the 11th, Friday, the 11th of December, just before uh, just before the uh, festive season starts. So thank you very much, Adam. Thank you again. It was really uh, it was really wonderful to meet and talk to you. And uh, and again, I wish you all. I hope you all stay safe. And I will speak to you all uh, speak to you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay.